Assalamu alaikum and a very good morning to everyone. Welcome to this CPC to discuss a middle-aged man with prolonged fever and raised alkaline phosphorus days. I am Prof. Rosmati, a consultant hepatologist. Now we are extremely delighted to have a multidisciplinary team with us this morning, starting with Dr. Deborah Chu, a gastroenterologist and hepatologist who is also the lead presenter. And the panelists include Dr. Juliana Firus, Bedi uh, Makta from Radiology, Professor Madia Dr. Faisal Muhammad, uh, respiratory physician, Professor Dr. Muhammad Shari, Muhammad Said, a consultant rheumatologist, and Professor Dr. Isa bin Muhammad Rose, a consultant histopathologist. And to make this session a lot more interactive, we had invited Dr. Wu Wing Hung, a trainee from the Internal Medicine Department, to be actively involved in the case discussion. So without much further ado, it gives me great pleasure to invite Dr. Deborah Chu to share her slides. Deborah, Thank you very much for the kind introduction, Prof. Rose. Very good morning to all the highly esteemed consultants, professors, and also my fellow colleagues. Today, I would like to start off my presentation with a word of thanks to all our panelists uh, who are involved in this multidisciplinary meeting. And without further ado, I will start my presentation. So today's clinical pathological conference is regarding a middle-aged patient with prolonged fever and raised ALP. So I will start with my case presentation, a 51-year-old Indian gentleman Presented with prolonged fever of two months duration, as well as night sweats, he had a remarkable loss of weight of 27 kilograms over the last four months with a weight loss of 86 to 60.7 kilograms and a chesty cough productive of sputum for one week's duration, accompanied by lethargy and shortness of breath. Of note, his negative symptoms are orthopnea, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, and pedal edema. So... His past medical history includes diabetes, ischemic heart disease post-cabbage, and a history of COVID pneumonia cat 4B, complicated by organizing pneumonia in July 2021, of which he was treated in HUKM, and he responded to a cause of high dose of prednisolone equivalent to 0.5 milligrams per kilogram at a regime of 30 milligrams once a day for four weeks, and then tapered down to 20 milligrams once a day for four weeks, and then tapered down to 10 milligrams once a day for two weeks, and five milligrams once a day for two two weeks thereafter stopping the prednisolone. So he, of note, he was recently admitted to Sungai Bulo Hospital in June 2022 for pleural effusion, of which he presented with shortness of breath and loss of weight of five kilograms in three months. He was thoroughly investigated then. His sputum AFB times three was negative. His pleural fluid analysis revealed a lights criteria that was exudative in nature. The AFB from the pleural fluid was negative. So was the MTB CNS. And the pleural, pleural fluid CNS was negative. How However, of note is the fact that his cytology was lymphocytic in nature. A CT thorax was subsequently done to complete the investigation, which revealed a nodule with speculated margins in the epicoposterior segment of the left upper lobe and also had the presence of multiple lymph adenopathy. Because of the suspicion of malignancy, a CT-guided lung biopsy was performed, and it revealed non-cassiating granuloma. And infective screening and tumor markers at this point was negative. Hence, he was diagnosed as paranemonic effusion and treated with a total of three weeks of antibiotics, rosafin for one week and tazosin for another two weeks, with resolution of fever subsequently. And thereafter, he was discharged. So I would like to invite Dr. Wu to give me his thoughts on this. Dr. Wu, do you agree with the diagnosis? And are there any further investigations that you would like to send or any further history that you would like to elicit from this patient at this point of time? Yeah, thank you uh, very much, Dr. Deborah, for the case illustration just now. So uh, I uh, kind of disagree with the diagnosis, uh, number one, because the patient presented with a chronic cough for the past two months with uh, constitutional symptoms. And uh, there's a X-ray, a CT scan show that there's a speculated mass with a HPE of non-caseating granuloma. So uh, my provisional diagnosis from this point of time will be like a, a chronic like a granulomatous uh, uh, pulmonary disease, such as a 
tuberculosis, pulmonary tuberculosis, or my second uh, provision diagnosis or uh, differential diagnosis will be uh, lung cancer, malignancy. So uh, what other further investigation I would like to ask in view of a patient uh, with a history of a COVID before he received a dose of uh, uh, prednisolone, which is uh, can cause patient to have an immunocompromise. So uh, what further investigation and uh, I would like to get was uh, I would like to do uh, uh, this um, uh, TB workup uh, to rule out any uh, possibility of TB, such as uh, ESR, MEM2 test. Uh, and then uh, from the CT scan, I would like to see, look uh, before, uh, beside uh, the masses, any other features uh, beside the lymph nodes and then any like uh, uh, tree in buds and then and all this, which suggestive of TB. And I would like to get a further history on uh, patient occupation, uh, and uh, history of a family, history of malignancy, and then and uh, history of TB contact, and uh, 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 was he a smoker? All these are relevant to the clinical uh, situation for this patient. Those are excellent thoughts, Wu. So indeed, he was a non-smoker. He had a BCG scar indicating previous vaccination. He had no family history of pulmonary tuberculosis and he worked as a security guard. He was married with three children and he lived in an apartment on the fourth floor. Other than that, his infective screening of hepatitis B and C was non-reactive and his HIV screen as well was non-reactive. A MANTU test was not done at this point. However, in terms of his pleural effusion, is there any other investigations that you would like to send to conclusively rule out the fact that he may or may not have pulmonary TB? Yes, uh, the most sensitive test uh, uh, is, uh, is a fluid ADA uh, with a cutoff point if more than 29, then which is suggestive of uh, TDB as well as uh, we should like, uh, if let's say still inconclusive, by right, we should do a pyroscopy. Excellent. And would you consider a pleural biopsy together with your pleuroscopy as well? Yes, yes, definitely. Excellent. So thank you very much, Dr. Wu. I think that your thoughts are exactly in the right direction. So moving on, he presented this time and on clinical examination, his GCS was full. He was slightly hypertensive with a blood pressure of 159 over 98. He was tachycardic with a heart rate of 110 and also hypoxic with an SpO2 of 93% on room air. His temperature was 39.8 degrees Celsius and his respiratory rate was 24 breaths per minute. He had no abnormalities on his cardiovascular exam, but his lungs revealed bronchial breath sounds over the left lower zone. On examination of his abdomen, it was unremarkable and soft non-tender. So these are the investigations that were taken in ED. Of note, he had a raised calcium of 2.68, a raised ESR as well as CRP. However, his total white was unremarkable and COVID PCR was not detected. He had a mildly elevated procalcitonin of 0.55. So at this point of time, over to you again, Dr. Wu. Are there any additional questions that you would like to ask and how would you manage this patient next? In view of the... Uh... Fever, persistent fever with a hypoxic uh, type 1 respiratory failure, and uh, blood investigation shows that the patient had a hypercalcemia 2.6, a mild hypercalcemia, but a normal phosphate and uh, raised uh, ESR. All these uh, suggestive could be uh, non IPTH uh, dependent hypercalcemia. So, with the background history of a chronic fever, cough, all these, we should suspect of this. Uh, granulometers uh, uh, infection or changes in the lung causing the hypercalcemia. But we also would like to ask for all the symptoms of hypercalcemia as patient has uh, this uh, uh, bone pain, uh, uh, abdominal pain, confusions, uh, and all this, and the ECG as well. Uh, so my top Professional at this point of time still uh, and any uh, an assessment from the uh, physical sorry uh, physical examination any dehydration uh, the status this all can cause a hypercalcemia. 
So uh, for further investigation, I'd like to do, of course, uh, I would like to check on this um, uh, from... Uh, okay, so for his hmm. further physical examination, he had no symptoms of bone or joint pain. And on examination of mucous membranes, he was dehydrated. And he did admit to having a poor oral intake for the last two weeks prior to his admission. And... At this point, sorry, at this point of time, he denies any contact with anyone with pulmonary tuberculosis. What other further investigations would you like to request from the patient? Uh, basically, a uh, routine like the uh, RFT and then uh, RP, FPC and the baseline investigation. And then and, uh, I would like to repeat another check sex ray uh, to look at the... Uh, uh, the lung lesions and the pure effusion to reassess again the patient. And then uh, I would like to uh, look at the baseline investigation. Then I will plan for the further uh, subsequent test for this patient. All right, so his ECG was unremarkable. He never had a history of chest pain. His troponin eye was not raised. And I will share with you the picture of his chest X-ray. Okay, so this is his chest x-ray. Would you like to comment on what you find in this chest x-ray? Yeah, this is a uh, AP portable view of, sorry, uh, Dr. You can Dr. share screen again? Sure. Yeah. So this is an AP view of a patient with a CSBG scar and borderline cardiomegaly. Uh, I can see actually there is a planted bilateral costophrenic angle with some reticular nodular uh, opacity, uh, bilateral mid zone to lower zone, which uh, uh, more prominent on the left lower zone. There's a, a reticular nodular opacity. So what is your differential diagnosis at this point of time in keeping with his history as well as physical examination? My top differential diagnosis still could be a PDB uh, in view of the uh, lung lesion and negative trop eye and negative failure symptoms. Uh, so, uh, and my differential could be like a sarcoidosis uh, and lung malignancy. Excellent. I think you are heading in the right direction. So moving on further, he was quickly managed by isolation because there was a worry that he could have pulmonary TB. He was treated for a typical, a typical pulmonary infection with broad spectrum coverage of IV augmentin as well as azithromycin. Blood and sputum cultures were taken prior to the administration of antibiotics and sputum AFB times three was also taken in the isolation room. The patient was then scheduled for a CT thorax and planned for a bronchoscopy in order to rule out pulmonary tuberculosis. So further investigations revealed a GGT of 143, which was mildly raised. Blood cultures before the administration of antibiotics, both, um, I will just stop for the prayers.
All right, so moving on to further investigations, his GGT was mildly elevated. Blood cultures, both aerobic and anaerobic, were unremarkable. Hepatitis B and C screen was negative, and so was past hepatitis B infection. AFB times 3 from the sputum was negative, and COVID PCR that was repeated was not detected. So, moving on to the current medical issue, the laboratory abnormalities, as well as his past medical history, he had a worsening ALP and his CRP was not improving. So, let me just share the screen again. So, in view of his lymphocytic pleural effusion, as well as the fact that he was treated with prednisolone high dose for 30 milligrams tapering down, an unresolving fever despite five days of antibiotics and his blood cultures being repeatedly negative and AFB times three being negative and a COVID PCR being negative. And after five days of augmentin and azithromycin, his high grade fever persisted. What is your differential diagnosis, Wu? Yeah, uh, my differential diagnosis at this point of time still uh, uh, TB, a uh, possible disseminated TB in view of this uh, mild organ involvement and uh, worsening ALP uh, with a raised GGT, which suggest suggestive of a hepatic origin. So I would like to do ultrasound or possible CTTAP to look for any other uh, TB organ involvement. And uh, I will look at the, um, any possible dilated hepatic duct uh, to look for the cause of the raised uh, ALP. And uh, uh, I also need to uh, see whether the A the ALT and AST, and we need to monitor the trend to see any like uh, possible hepatitis. So at this point of time, uh, provisional diagnosis still could be a, a possible uh, pulmonary TB with uh, uh, dissemination. Excellent. So what other further investigations would you request, given the fact that, as you can see here on day five of the antibiotic treatment, there is unresolving fever? Is there any imaging that you would like to perform? Yes, uh, CECT TAP, contrasted TAP. Excellent thoughts. So I would like to invite Dr. Juliana to share on the radiological findings next on the CT TAP that was performed. Yeah, Assalamualaikum and a very good morning to everyone. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to be a part of the CPC today. So, um, Let's start to analyze the images first. So we have a Mr. G, 51 years old. So let's look at the CT. As we can uh, listen to the presentation just now, uh, the initial presentation was a fever as well as cough. And this is uh, showing you in long window. It's a coronal as well as axial section. We can see that this CT thorax is having a ground glass opacity here, predominantly over the left lower lobes, a bit on the uh, right, uh, on the right side as well, predominantly at the peripheral. And on axial section here, we are appreciating some perirobular density. Okay, giving these uh, imaging findings of a ground glass, perirobular density, and a bit of interceptor thickening at the subdural region here. Um, we suspect that this patient having a COVID pneumonia at that moment of time. Um, Subsequently, this patient has another repeat CT, which is almost one year in uh, interval. And what we can see here, obviously, we are seeing more distribution of a miliary or micronodules throughout the, both of the lungs. So this is a coronal section, axial and a zoom, uh, zoom in section of the axial CT thorax in lung window. So this patient has micronodules, as you can uh, see here, around here. It is random in distribution. We have a part of a consolidation over the right lower lobe as well as the left lower lobe. Okay, there is no pleural effusion at the moment of time. So given that this patient having a persistent or prolonged fever, the diagnosis, uh, preliminary imaging diagnosis would be of pulmonary tuberculosis. All right. A bit on the pulmonary tuberculosis, um, we also uh, see the medicinal window. This is a medicinal window of the recent city in August 2022, whereby we are appreciating some lymph, lymph nodes. 
So this is at the pre-carina level. So this is your carina. This is the lymph nodes which are enlarged. We have also um, hyla lymph nodes as well. So this patient doesn't have any necrotic center in, within the lymph nodes. The lymph nodes are homogeneously enhancing. There is no necrotic lymph nodes at this moment of time. So a bit on the tuberculosis, we've known that it is coming from the microbacterium tuberculosis and it's airborne. It is aerobic, non-metal and non-sporing spore forming rods. So TB can be everywhere. As you know, we can have 80% of the cases will be pulmonary and lesser 20% could be in extrapulmonary. In tuberculosis, we are classify, classifying it into active phase as well as latent phase. In active phase, we have primary as well as post-primary. Primary is defined when it is shortly developed as long, uh, after the infection, it develops um, rapidly. And in post-primary, after a latent uh, period of time, and it reactivates. So these are the imaging findings that we can see in primary as well as post-primary. For radiographic findings as well as CT findings, mostly it uh, correlates together. And, and in pulmonary TB, we can appreciate that there is consolidation nodules that we can see with being it micronodules or macronodules, we can see cavitation as well and it's normally seen in post-primary TB. We can see also TB in lymphadenopathies as in our patient, we, we are finding involvement of the medicinal as well as high lung nodes. The miliary TB would be uh, representing as random uh, miliary nodules of less than three millimeters, such as our patient. We could also have granulomas. Uh, or tuberculomas, which is soft tissue density, and some has calcification within, and we can also have pleural involvement. Okay, a bit on the uh, pulmonary TB. As you can see in our patient as well, it is randomly distribu distributed. It is micronodules in size, and some has subpleural in location. Okay, we can also have consolidation, pleural efficient, and miliary nodules. Uh, how about this one? So we can see uh, in the radiograph, we are appreciating some lucent cvitin. This is a thick cavitating lesion that we are seeing it and correlating with the CT scan. Uh, we are having this cavitating lesion uh, showed by the arrowhead and interspersed consolidation area with uh, further lucent cvitin also signifying cavitating lesion. And this is a, of post-primary tuberculosis. Similarly, this is what uh, this is. This slide just wanted to show uh, the gross specimen of a cavitating lesion, and again another CT on coronal view lung window. We are appreciating a very thick wall cavitating lesion. Well, um, CECT scan of the thorax, abdomen, pelvis was performed in August two thousand twenty-two. So the recent CT. So appreciate that this liver has no focal liver lesion here. There is no biliary duct dilatation. The portal veins is well opacified here. The rest of the abdominal organs are quite unremarkable. Let's compare it from September 2021 to August 2022. So this September is actually a HRCT thorax where it is non-contrasted. And this is the contrasted one in August 2022. Uh, and I just wanted you to focus uh, here at the mesenteric anteriorly here. The mesenteric fat is of hypo or black in attenuation, right? If you can appreciate in the recent one, only residual mesenteric fat is left at the anterior of the liver here, whereby the mesenteric fat over the left side is obliterate with the peritoneal soft tissue density and is enhancing location located here. All right, so this is signifying a, of a peritoneal nodules and it's enhancing. A lower down cut, let me erase you the ink there. So on lower down cut, we can appreciate that, that these peritoneal nodules is diffuse. It is occupying the right lower half of the abdomen up until the left lower half of the abdomen. The small bowel is closely adhered to these peritoneal nodules as well as the rectus abdominis anteriorly here. However, in the bowels, there is no abnormal bowel dilatation or abnormal bowel thickening appreciated. 
and we are also appreciating some mesentery lymph nodes up around here. However, it's sub-centimeter in size. Subsequently, this patient has raised ALP. Okay, um, so ultrasound HBS was that hepatobiliary system, and this uh, ultrasound is showing you a well defined hyperechoic lesion which is located at segment four, as depicted in the picture, as well as segment five adjacent to the gallbladder. Here, uh, this is uh, almost geographical, and uh, the, the preliminary imaging diagnosis, uh, given that it is geographical and hyperechoic and quite well defined, is steatosis of the liver. There is no focal, other focal liver lesion seen on this ultrasound HPS. There is no biliary duct dilatation as seen in the CT as well. So a bit on the hepatic TB. Um, hepatic TB is extremely rare. As I mentioned, a subpulmonary TB accounts for 20% and hepatic TB accounts to less than 1%. However, it's increasing in immunocompromised patients. And a lot of the journals are uh, classifying various types of hepatic tuberculosis with different types of imaging findings. Um, the routes of propagation would be if the, it is hematogenously spread uh, from the miliary TB, it could spread via the hepatic artery. Uh, if it's from the GIT tract, uh, it could uh, spread via the portal vein and localized within the hepatic via portal vein and as well as lymphatic spread. Just wanted to show you this um, publication by Shambu et al. Uh, they retrospectively see uh, and classify 15 cases of a HPE proven hepatic tuberculosis over the period of five years. And within these five patient, 15 cases, there are pulmonary TB of three patients, chronic hepatitis of one patient, and also immunodeficiency of one patient. So what did they wrote? So they classify the uh, imaging findings of hepatic TB into four types. One would be the subcapsular, hypodensity, and somewhat we will have nodular or even ill-defined calcification within. We have the parenchymal type, which accounts to this hypodensity, which is randomly distributed within the whole of liver, and it is subclassified into sizes of miliary, cystic, and nodular subtype. And we also have mixed type where it is a hypodensity at location of subcapsular as well as the parenchymal liver. And the rarest of all is the tuberculous cholangitis, which involves the biliary duct and calcification along the wall of the bile ducts. Um, I found one of the journal as well, also saying similar cases um, where they introduce us to another form of classification, which is quite similar. I will show you later on. But what, uh, um, what has been published in this journal is they wrote a quote of hepatomegaly could be the only imaging finding that could be found in hepatic tuberculosis. So why is that actually? So these are the classification types which are uh, published in this um, journal. So uh, it is hypodensity of nature, and they classify it to sizes of 0.5 to 2 millimeter and more larger ones to 3 centimeter. So the imaging that is only hepatomegaly is most probably because of the result, it is lower than the resolution of the what the CT or the ultrasound could be detected. So as our in, uh, in our patient, we only have hepatomegaly and there were no focal liver lesion detected on both CT as well as the ultrasound. Uh, so can we differentiate it uh, in imaging wise, whether it becoming a tuberculosis or drug-induced liver injury? Um, the journal was mentioning that it could appear similar, somewhat hepatomegaly, but they are mentioned and also hypodensities. But this hypodensities accounts for edema because of the acute injury, and it could also have this periportal edema and the gallbladder wall edema. So this accounts again to the clinical examination or presentation of patient having a acute substance abuse or to diagnose this drug induced liver injury because of the rarity and this is a diagnosis of exclusion. 
So again, we come back to our patient. So this patient, uh, our patient, Mr. G, has lung present uh, lung imaging findings of consolidation as well as micronodules that is randomly distributed throughout the lung. We have peritoneum uh, involvement of thicken and enhancing at the abdomen, and we have also. Uh, lymphadenopathies, which is involving the medicinal as well as the highland lymphadenopathies. So the imaging diagnosis um, for this patient would be the pulmonary as well as extra pulmonary involvement of tuberculosis. So uh, we are correlating again with the clinical, laboratory, histopathological, and exclude the bacteriological as well uh, to gain the confidence in diagnosing this patient. And why do we have to early diagnose this patient? Now, it, of course, to uh, early eradicate this patient and for increase of the survival of this patient. And with that, thank you for your attention and assalamualaikum. Thank you very much, Dr. Juliana. That was an excellent exposition. So moving on to our case. So as we tie up everything together, we see that this patient CT thorax mass might likely have been due to an effective cause. And in view of the unresolving fever, as well as the constellation of CT scan findings, Dr. Wu, what would you like to do for this patient and how would you like to manage this patient? Yeah, uh, from the investigation and the imaging, uh, we confirmed that this patient most likely are having a disseminated TB. So to treat this, we should start uh, anti-TB uh, with uh, uh, EHRZ regime. But in view of the worsening ARP and uh, this uh, ALT, uh, we need to monitor the LFT and possibly we need to start bridging therapy such as uh, SEM in this patient. Excellent. And, mm. Thank you for your thoughts, Dr. Wu. You are in the correct line of thinking. So indeed, this patient was commenced on SEM because of the raised ALP and I would like to further invite Prof Faisal just to comment on the management of NTTB and in a patient with uh, elevated liver enzymes. Okay. Assalamualaikum and uh, good morning. Thank you, Dr. Deborah. Uh, first of all, actually, um, it's a common scenario that uh, you see drug-induced liver injury secondary to NTTB. But in this case, to begin with, this patient has hepatitis, right? But uh, as a physician, I think, uh, Dr. Wu, you need to know how to manage if you see uh, this kind of patient. And of course, uh, SEM is the uh, the most uh, safest um, NTTB bridging therapy to start with when you have a hepatitis. But what if you have a patient who develop drug-induced liver injury uh, secondary to, to hepatitis? So um, when do you stop the NTTB and when do you bridge them? Maybe I can ask Dr. Wu first because these are the common scenario that you will see uh, yeah, as a physician. Thank you, thank you, Prof. So, uh, according to CBG, TB CBG, so uh, when we started initiated uh, anti TB, we need to monitor LFT frequently. So, once the ALT more than five times upper limit patient asymptomatic, or two or more times are upper limit of the L force, or when the ALT three times above the upper limit and together with a bilirubin more than two times upper limit, we should stop the NTTB or bridge with a SEM. All right. Um, that's an excellent thought. So there are a few guidelines. Okay, one is you use the American Thoracic Society guidelines. So it is uh, stated that uh, when the ALT is more than five times upper limit of normal, if the patient is asymptomatic, or the ALT is more than three times upper limit of normal with symptoms, and, and ERS guidelines have also included that the bilirubin level. So if the bilirubin is more than uh, uh, more than 51, if you follow the ERS guideline, ATS state that bilirubin more than two times upper limit of normal. So these are different guidelines used when do we withhold NTTP. But in Malaysian CPG, they have also included ALP, yeah, the Malaysian later CPG fourth edition. If the ALP increase two times upper limit of normal, you need to also withhold the NTTP. And Dr. Wood, when is the when do you re-challenge them? So this uh, is another common yeah. scenario. Once the ALT less than two times uh, upper limit, uh, and then uh, patient clinically better, so we will challenge with uh, rifampicin 
we will start with a gradual uh, with 150, then we increase to 300 and 600 subsequently. And on the day four, we if let's say the ART remains normal, static, then we might need to introduce the other ones, the second one, isonazide. Okay, thanks, uh, Dr. Wu. Uh, basically, we know that drug-induced liver injury, 75% of the time occurs within the first 60 days. And out of these 75%, 50% occurs within the first 20 days. That is why it's very important to, to monitor uh, uh, this, this patient. So this is a guideline from uh, American Thoracic Society. So once the ALT less than two times upper limit of normal, you can start introducing them one by one. And the most common drug that can cause uh, hepatitis is uh, parazinamide. Okay, so and the least common is actually itambutol. So that is why we start then bridging therapy of streptomycin, itambutol, and uh, a third generation quinolone, such as amoxifloxacin initially. Okay, and um, in Malaysian CPG, what they mentioned was that in NTTB uh, drug induced liver injury, liver function should be monitored closely, and NTTB drugs only to be introduced when the liver function becomes normal. So it depends on which guideline do you use. If you follow the ATS guideline, you can introduce them faster, you know. But if you follow the Malaysian CPG, you have to wait for all the liver functions to be normalized first before you introduce the NTTP. Okay, uh, that's all for me, Deborah. Thank you. You're muted, Deborah. Thank you very much, Prof. Faisal, for your excellent presentation. So now we will continue our sharing. So in view of the fact that this is likely disseminated tuberculosis, the patient was, uh, with the presence of transaminitis, the patient was started on SEM. And we can see that there was a good response towards the commencement of SEM. And once the SEM was commenced on day six, the fever subsided. However, of note is the fact that the ALP started to increase after the commencement of NTTB. So this shows us that the NTTB is working and we are likely working in the right direction in terms of our treatment of disseminated TB. However, the ALP is worsening. So the question that we have is, is the ALP liver or non-liver in origin in this patient? So Dr. Wu, are there any other further tests that you could elicit in order to see whether this patient is having an ALP from a liver or non-liver etiology? Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Deborah. So uh, we would like to send a GGT. So if a GGT is raised, uh, which is uh, more suggestive of a hepatic origin. Uh, so, um, and then of course, uh, in this case, a worsening ARP, and then we also should do a liver biopsy to confirm our diagnosis to see whether this is a hepatic uh, cholestasis, uh, cholestasis secondary to drug or infection or granulomatous changes. Excellent thoughts, Dr. Wu. So as we discussed earlier, the ALP can be from either liver or non-liver source. So broadly, the ALP sources are intestinal, placenta, germ cell, liver, bone, and kidney. And when we look at the causes, any kind of obstruction to the biliary ducts can cause a raised ALP. Paget's disease of the bone or any other disease of the bone can cause ALP rise because ALP is a byproduct of osteoblast activity. Other than that, hyperparathyroidism and vitamin D deficiency can also result in ALP rise. So does untreated celiac disease, seminomas, and ectopic ALP production from malignant as well as hepatocellular carcinoma. So in view of the fact that this patient had a disseminated TB, hence there was a worry that there could be bone involvement of the TB. So a skeletal survey was performed, which was unremarkable. There were no lytic or punched out bone lesions or cortical breaks seen throughout the skeletal survey, indicating that it was unlikely that the patient had bone involvement with TB. So the other question that remained to us is, could this be anti-TB induced drug induced liver injury? So let us look at the facts and figures of anti-TB DLE. The global incidence of DLE is high, which can range from two to 28%, and it can vary from a mild asymptomatic elevation of transaminases to acute liver failure. So what are the risk factors for anti-TB induced DLE? They are female gender, 
Combination therapy using hepatotoxic drugs such as isoniazide, rifampicin, and pyrazinamide, and a rechallenge, as well as the concomitant presence of alcoholism and viral hepatitis, all of which this patient did not have. And he was not on a hepatotoxic regime of NTTP. So we can safely say that this patient does not have NTTP induced drug induced liver injury. Hence, because of the worry that this was disseminated TB to multiple organs, there was a need to broaden the anti-TB coverage. Hence, he was challenged with rifampicin. And we see here the trend of his rifampicin. When he was challenged with rifampicin, the ALP remained static. However, when he was started on isoniazide, there was a gradual increase in AFP from 700 to 900 plus. So at this point of time, there was a worry as to why the ALP was elevated and a likely liver source causing the ALP elevation. Hence, liver-specific antibodies were sent. And of note is the fact that AMA is negative as well as AMA M2 was negative as well. However, the ANA was strongly positive at a titer of one in a thousand. The IgG was raised almost two times the upper limit of normal and IgG4 was also markedly raised. So, Dr. Wu, given all the constellation of findings with the positive serologies of IgG4 and IgG and negative AMA and AMA M2, what are your differentials at this point? So, my top differential diagnosis at this point of time still could be a hepatic TB. And uh, my differential will be in view of the raise of the uh, autoimmune marker. So it could be uh, like a, a autoimmune hepatitis with uh, this IgG4. So it could be related to IgG4 related disease, such as uh, with worsening ALP. So what worried me is uh, IgG4 sclerosing cholangitis. So to uh, diagnose uh, or differentiate all these cause, uh, I think a liver biopsy is mandatory here. So we need to look at the liver biopsy, the HPE, whether it's suggestive of a drug-induced or uh, autoimmune, or is it a purely a hepatitis TB? Or perhaps a MRCP also can, we can look at uh, uh, the any in, uh, dilated intrahepatic uh, duct. Excellent thoughts, Dr. Wu. So at this point of time, he denied any autoimmune symptoms, strongly denied alcohol, and corroborative history from the family also confirms this. There was never any rash, arthralgia, or arthritis, no family history of autoimmune disease, and no history of pruritus or any other TCM, JAMU, or supplement intake. But in view of the fact that there was an elevated IgG4, hepatomegaly, as well as ALP, a differential diagnosis of possible IgG4 disease of the liver was entertained. Of course, at the back of our minds, we had to rule out PBC or PSC. And because of the rapidly worsening ALP, prednisolone 10 milligrams once a day was commenced to cover for IgG4 disease of the liver. So at this point of time, I would like to invite our expert rheumatologist, Prof. Dr. Mohamed Shari, to give us his expert opinion on IgG4 disease. Okay, thank you, Dr. Deborah, for, uh, for the... Uh, uh, we can the... hardly hear you, Prof. Sharil. Can you uh, increase the volume <clears throat> of your mic? Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Right. Okay, so uh, thank you for inviting me to give a short uh, talk, talk and exposure on IgG4. Now, unfortunately, in Malaysia, we do not have any data yet on the epidemiology of IgG4 in uh, in Malaysia. However, hopefully with my colleagues uh, study on IgG4, Prof. Uh, Dr. Saktis Wari's study uh, in the end will tell us at least about uh, what uh, IgG4 is in uh, in UKM M uh, MC uh, and hopefully we can actually know uh, closely what the, the profile is uh, for IgG4 disease. Now, uh, of course, uh, the hallmarks, and as you can see in modern pathology study, consensus statement of IgG4 depending on lot on uh, histology of dense lymphoplasma cytic infiltration, uh, and as a result, uh, the attacks will uh, will be accompanied by some degree of fibrosis, and the phlebitis will be obliterated and and increased number of eosinophils. Huh? That's why in some uh, instances. Uh, the old medic uh, diseases of of vasculitis of Chirk Strauss 
has always been uh, associated with IgG4, but at that time, uh, no one thinks of ordering an immunoglobulin profile in that sense. So the pathophysiology, uh, it's all involving CD4 T lymphocytes. And when you have that, then you have lymph nodes. You can have SLE-like diseases, NA positive and things like that because CDD4 and B cells are very closely related to uh, overproduction of antibodies. And, uh, and interestingly, in this uh, paper of uh, uh, quite an old paper of 2010, uh, it is related to uh, a lot of uh, GI involvements uh, and, and also limb node involvements such as uh, your Mikulic syndrome, head and neck limited diseases, retroperitoneal uh, fibrosis and your pancreatohepatobiliary disease, uh, four phenotypes associated with uh, IgG4. And, uh, and we can actually start treating. Before we start treating, we have to pre-evaluate uh, the patient of doing all your uh, simple full blood counts, uh, IgG subclass levels, IgE concentration, serum protein, electrophoresis, C3, C4 levels, and uh, HbA1c, yeah, all uh, very closely related with, uh, with also other associated uh, diseases of IgG4. And, uh, and this includes as well stool testing, uh, biomarkers in stool for, uh, for IgG4 uh, activity, urinalysis for GNs and, and, uh, and also effect of IgG4 in, on the kidney and imaging such as uh, CTTAP, uh, MRI and uh, PET scanning. This is uh, also uh, IgG4 can be related to paraneoplastic as well. So uh, we start off by initial therapy for remission and induction, which is quite typical of uh, gynecology, uh, oncology and, and your uh, uh, rheumatology. And the treatment is as such, uh, steroids, cyclophosphamide, if it doesn't work, and uh, rituximab, and later on, maintenance with either uh, MMF or azathioprine. So uh, this is probably my last uh, slide of, of, uh, of IgG4. Uh, but then again, uh, it is a very interesting uh, disease to look at, especially in our uh, population. And uh, uh, because it is related to what has been presented, I'm not surprised if the final diagnosis is IgG4 because of the involvement of the GI uh, system and also the immunocompromised state of the patient getting uh, uh, pulmonary tuberculosis, uh, uh, TB, this disseminated TB in that sense. So that's all from me. Uh, and uh, worse comes to worse, if you have retroperitoneal fibrosis and vascular involvement, these are amenable to uh, surgery to relieve the compression and so on. Uh, thank you from, uh, from me. Thank you, Prof. Sherrick. Um, in view of time, let's look at the liver biopsy. And then, uh, because most of this is really dependent on the liver biopsy. Can I, can I invite Prof. Isa, please, to show us or discuss the liver biopsy? Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Dr. Badrol. I'm a pathology trainee together with my specialist, uh, Associate Prof. Dr. Issa Muhammad Rose. Uh, before that, thank you for inviting us, pathology team, for this current uh, CPC. So uh, uh, for this uh, CPC, I will uh, discuss the histopathological findings of this case. So basically, we received a liver biopsy. So this is the few strips of liver tissue. Okay, so on this lower power, you can see there is this uh, patchy areas of um, uh, hyperchromatic uh, dark purplish areas, which we I'm not sure what is that. So we goes under higher power. So basically, what uh, it is is a multiple foci of non-caseating granuloma formations. Yes, okay, uh, which compose of epithelioid. Um, um, histiocytes uh, rimmed by the lymphocytes, okay? And there is also focal areas of minimal caseating necrosis, okay? This is the caseation necrosis here, okay? 
and surrounded by the epithelial histocyte as well as uh, rimmed by lymphocytes. Okay, another pictures of uh, granuloma formations uh, caseate with caseating necrosis here. Okay, so this is all the granuloma formations. And here also you can see there is a multi uh, multinucleated giant cells. Okay, this is the Langhan type of multinucleated giant, uh, giant cells where usually it is in horseshoe shapes. Okay, another pictures of multinucleated giant cells, uh, Langhan types, okay, uh, which the cells uh, with nuclei are arranged in the horseshoe shapes. This is another stain, uh, which is a periodic acid uh, shift stain, where basically it's highlights the glycogens inside the hepatocytes. So under low power, you already can see there is a multiple patches areas which do not pick up the periodic acid, uh, acid shift stains, where usually it will give rise the magenta colors, like in this, uh, the one that I pointed. Okay, so basically this is uh, actually the granuloma formations. Okay, under higher power, so you can see there is a multiple patches areas of uh, granuloma formations. Okay. We also did a reticulin stain where usually it highlights the reticulin fibers within the sinusoids. This is on the left side, you can see this is a normal uh, liver uh, architectures. Okay, so this is a how uh, in reticulin stain, how the normal liver looks like. Okay. However, in this area, there is already destructions of the reticulin fibers within the granuloma formations. Uh, moving on to the portal tracts, okay, portal tracts usually it has uh, the uh, biliary ducts, um, uh, hepatic arteries, as well as this one is hepatic artery, as well as portal veins. So in this portal tract, uh, there only shows a mild infiltrations of lymphocytes uh, with occasional uh, plasma cells and eosinophils. Okay, so this is the biliary ducts. This is the portal veins. Okay, so basically there is uh, only mild infiltrations of lymphocytes. Otherwise, there is no um, evidence of interface hepatitis here. Okay, this is the one the arrow pointed is actually a eosinophils, a very occasional eosinophils, the eosinophilic granular cytoplasm within the portal tract. So because of this patient clinically had um, uh, tuberculosis and with the presence of the granuloma inflammation, uh, gran granulomatous inflammation, so we did a few uh, special stains to help in our diagnosis. So we did uh, zelnesen stain, where basically zelnesen stain is to highlight the presence of the acid fast bacilli. Okay. However, in this case, it was a negative. So you can see on these pictures uh, here, this is uh, how the uh, uh, acid fast bacilli look like if uh, it is positive. However, in this case, it is negative. Okay. Uh, other stain that we do is uh, GMS stains, where basically it highlights the fungal bodies, where fungal infection also can, can, can give rise to the granuloma formations. So otherwise, uh, in this case, also the GMS stains are negative. So in this picture, this is how uh, GMS stains um, highlights the fungal bodies. So because of uh, granulomatous hepatitis and the patient clinically uh, treated with uh, disseminated TB, so our di final diagnosis is granulomatous hepatitis consistent with underlying disseminated TB. However, and the comments are the pathology are mainly due to the underlying disseminated tuberculosis. So our differential diagnosis uh, includes sarcoidosis as well as drug-induced liver injury. Okay, so when we talk about granulomatous hepatitis, uh, the main uh, differential diagnosis is disseminated tuberculosis as well as sarcoidosis. So I will just give a few um, uh, informations regarding sarcoidosis granulomas. So sarcoidosis granuloma in the liver are seen in the cases um, uh, of sarcoidosis where usually it is mainly located in the portal tract and to extend in the lobules. 
like for this case, basically this granuloma usually um, happens in the water tracts and in the uh, lobules parenchyma as well. And uh, in sarcoidosis granuloma, usually it is multiple, large and non-necrotizing granuloma with multinucleated giant cells and containing uh, Schaumann bodies, asteroid bodies, and calcium oxalate crystals. However, in this case, um, we can see there is a, also a focal areas of necrotizing granuloma formations. So uh, the most important aspect of differentiation between uh, whether is it a sarcoidosis or infectious granuloma is by the presence of the caseous necrosis as in this case. So uh, as such, case aging granuloma with central necrosis must be considered as an infection until serious evidence eliminates, uh, eliminates the diagnosis. So this is uh, uh, the diagram shows the in case patient with hepatic sarcoidosis, which showing a non caseating granulomas. And this is how an asteroid bodies looks like. And this is how the Schaumann's bodies looks like. This is all where, we, where you can see in uh, hepatic sarcoidosis. However, in this case, we didn't, we cannot find there is a, a evidence of asteroid bodies and also Schaumann's bodies. So because of that, we conclude as this patient had granulomatous hepatitis uh, consistent with underlying disseminated TB. So I think uh, that's all from me. Thank, Thank you. you, Dr. Badro. So uh, Dr. Debra uh, will show your um, last slide uh, to yeah. conclude. And we'll so the, all right. So the patient responded very well to the NTTB regime and the ALP near normalized at the most recent blood taking where his ALP was 174. Clinically, he gained six kilograms after the commencement of NTTB after six weeks and hence in view of the clinical improvement of the ALP, as well as the weight gain and the fever that resolved with the commencement of NTTB, the diagnosis was in keeping with disseminated tuberculosis to the liver. And with that, I would like to hand over to Prof. Ross to tie up uh, and give us an expert opinion on this case presentation. Over to you, Prof. Ross. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, everyone, for the lovely input and the wonderful uh, discussion that we had so far. So I think to just wrap up, uh, there is no doubt now that this patient has tuberculosis and the liver involvement uh, as shown on the histology is typically shown as a granulomatous hepatitis. And this is not so uh, uncommon. It's just that maybe it is underdiagnosed. So the typical presentation in the person who actually has granulomatous hepatitis due to TB it may be differing from the ones that is part of a miliary tuberculosis, where the hepatic involvement is just part of generalized miliary TB with no signs or symptoms relevant to the liver. So in this patient, uh, the TB or granulomatous hepatitis, they presented with unexplained fever, he had hepatomegaly. And although the granulomas did not show very much of caseation, there were areas where uh, the the caseating granulomas was also shown. And then this does not mean to say that it, it excludes the diagnosis because uh, in this reports that we've seen, uh, the granul granulomas may be caseating or non-caseating. And in this case, I think there is no doubt there are some areas of caseation in this patient. So I think the high alkaline phosphatase was actually a hallmark that you see in a person with granulomatous uh, tuberculosis. And um, this is something related to infiltration. Uh, I'm so sorry that we did not have much time for questions uh, because we're already at nine o'clock. And I, I think what we would like to actually share with you is this patient. If you actually have a patient presenting with typical symptoms of, uh, of either palmar TB or even part of disseminated TB, and if there is any signs or symptoms related to the liver, then you must think also of tuberculosis or granulomatous hepatitis as part of the picture, as the treatment may be slightly prolonged in some of these cases. Um, so I will wrap up and thank everyone. And uh, again, uh, I'm very sorry that you're not able to uh, have the chance to have questions, but we'll get Dr. Deborah. You can contact Dr. Deborah if there is anything that you'd like to discuss with. I'm sure Dr. Deborah would mind. I'd like to thank all the panelists and the speakers and presenters, especially Dr. Deborah and uh, also Dr. Wu, 
for making this an interactive session. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Prof. Thank you.